Okay, so this lecture is going to introduce us to the heart. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, the heart's anatomy, and then I want to talk about how blood moves through the heart today. Um, our next lecture will be on heart valves, which will be your discussion question. But we want to make sure that you kind of understand the main parts of the heart so that that way you'll understand the discussion questions we discuss in the next lecture. So let's begin with the heart's anatomy. So your heart is about the size of your fist. And if you remember, um, when we talk about the human body, it's very proportional. So, you know, some people have larger fists than other people, which means that their heart would be a little larger than someone whose fist was smaller. And when we find the heart, it's enclosed within what we call the mediastinum. It's basically the very middle of your bony thorax, just behind the sternum. Um, and the rib cage is where you'll find your heart. Um, it rests on the superior surface, so the top surface of the diaphragm, which is the muscle, of course, that runs right along the bottom of the rib cage that helps us to be able to expand our lungs. It is in, right in front of your vertebral column, right below the sternum, or right behind the sternum, and the lungs are actually on the left and right of it, and they actually cover across the top of it, so when you're looking in the chest cavity, you only see a very small portion of the heart sticking out. The heart lies about two thirds of the whole heart lie on the left of the body. So that's why when we say put your hand over your heart, we hold our hand over the left portion of our body, our left portion of our chest, because that's where the bulk of the heart is found. And if you're looking at the heart, the back of it is very broad, very flat, um, and also the posterior or the back surface of it is it almost will lay flat whenever you're getting ready to dissect it. So this is what your heart looks like. And this is where it would be found within the chest. Here is the middle line right down the middle, the mid sagittal plane of the chest cavity. You can see here that about one third or a little less is on the right side. And then, of course, on the left side. The patient's left, you would find two thirds of the heart. If you look at this picture right here, you can see that these are the lungs. And so, right here, this would be the vertebral column. So, you can see how the lungs kind of overlap in front of it. This would be the sternum right here. And then, right here, you can see that they've pulled back the lungs so that you could see where the heart would be. And then, this is the diaphragm that runs along the bottom of it. So the heart is found in this double-walled sac that's known as the pericardium. Um, there's a very loose-fitting part on the outside that we call the fibrous pericardium because it's made of fibrous tissue. The pericardium has some important jobs. The main one, of course, is to protect the heart. Anytime we can protect the heart, that's good. But also our heart does a very violent contraction. And so the pericardium makes sure that it stays anchored where it needs to be so that it doesn't go bebopping all around the, house, the, the, the body. And then, of course, the pericardium is there to prevent for overfilling of the heart with blood. So it kind of serves as almost like a girdle. So inside that fibrous pericardium that's real loose, you're going to find a very slippery, thin layer of tissue, actually two layers of tissue, known as the serous pericardium. And we've talked about serous fluid before, very, 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 uh, it's like a lubricant that allows your, your organs to move around without friction. Well, this serous fluid allows your heart to be able to beat without rubbing against the pericardium every time that it beats because we want friction-free environment for the heart because if we don't have a friction-free environment, then the heart's going to rub against that pericardium and that could do damage to the heart. Individuals who have inflammation to their pericardium, it's called pericarditis. And this is a problem because pericarditis, that inflammation, hinders the body from producing the serous fluid, which means that now as the heart beats, it rubs against the pericardium and it begins to almost like if you wear shoes that rub up and up and down against the back of your heel, it can begin to like almost blister it. It, it begins to, to wear away at it. Um, when you listen to the heart and an individual who has pericarditis, you can hear it. There's a creaking sound like ring. 
break, 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 whenever they listen to, to the heart. And it causes uh, great pain. Um, we've talked about pleurisy before and how when you breathe with pleurisy, the lungs are kind of, they've lost that friction-free environment, so they grate and it hurts. It's the same thing, but this time it's the heart. If this persists, it can really cause some problems to the heart and its ability to do things because it will cause these adhesions or, or almost like sores on the outside of the heart and they don't contract, which means that the heart loses some of that ability to contract and move blood through the body. So our heart's divided into layers. We have the epicardium, which this is the outer layer. Anytime we see epi, it usually means outer. And um, it's got the serous pericardium around it. We also find a lot of fat sometimes in this layer. The myocardium is the thick part. Myo, of course, we know means muscle. So this is the cardiac muscle. So this is the part that's doing all the contracting. It forms the bulk of your heart, forms the, most of the, the weight of the heart is found in the myocardium. And then on the inside of the heart, we find the endocardium. And the endocardium is um, basically a thin sheet of tissue that lines the heart's chambers and it covers the valves um, to protect them. And this is a picture of it. You can see here's the fibrous pericardium and then this is the pericardial ca um, cavity and this is where we'll find the fluid. And um, so this is where the heart's going to be doing the beating and the serous fluid be in here. And then there's your muscle and then this is the endocardium that's lining this chamber. So let's talk about those chambers. Our heart has four chambers. We have two atria on the top, the superior, and we have two ventricles on the bottom, the inferior ventricles. Atria is the plural form of atrium. There's one atrium on the left, one atrium on the right, which together make the two superior atria. Our heart um, has one side that's dealing with oxygenated blood and one side that deals with deoxygenated blood. So to keep those sides separate, we have a partition. And where it divides between the two atria, we call that the interatrial septum. And where it divides the two ventricles, we call that the interventricular septum. And it just separates the right from the left side of the heart. And this is where you can see it right here. So here's the atria right here. This is the right atrium. This is the left atrium. And then this would be the right ventricle. And then this would be the left ventricle. And this is that interventricular septum that runs up to here. You can't see the interatrial septum because it's behind this vessel right here, this pulmonary artery. So you can't see that. So the atria are receiving chambers. So any blood that is coming back into the heart comes in through one of the atrium. Um, the back side of the atrium on the back part of the heart is very smooth, but on the front side, they're more rigid walls. The one cool thing is this right here. And let me show you. I'm going to go back. This is the fossa ovalis right here. It's a little depression. You see me pointing to it. The fossa ovalis, um, when we were born, we had a little hole in our heart called the foramen ovale. And then at a certain point, that foramen ovale covers up and um, that spot, that, that hole is gone, but there still remains a little depression right there. And I've done a lot of reading and, and really no one knows why we have that, uh, what the purpose of it was, but um, it was once there. So our atria are the receiving chambers for blood, meaning that when blood comes back from the body or from the lungs, from circulation, it goes back into one of the atrium. And atrium don't have to do a lot of work in contracting because they just move the blood from the atrium down into the ventricle and those touch. So there's not like a lot of, of you know, distance that has to happen for the blood to move from one to the other. So because of that, atria are not overworked, and so the muscle is not 
very big. It's not a very hefty muscle. And so the atrium typically are small and are thin. So blood comes through the right atrium through three, three veins. Um, the superior vena cava, which is at the top of the heart, it picks up blood basically from the superior portion of the body, so from the diaphragm up. Um, the inferior vena cava, it returns blood from below the diaphragm. So anywhere from the diaphragm below is going to come in through the inferior vena cava. And then there's one more circulation. It's actually the shortest circulation in the body called the coronary sinus. And basically these are just blood vessels that collect blood from the heart itself and puts it back into the heart for circulation. We have four pulmonary veins that enter the left atrium that make up a large portion of the heart's base. The pulmonary veins, their job is to transport blood from the lungs back to the heart. And the only way you can really see these is if you flip the heart over and look at the back of it. The ventricles are known as the discharging chambers. And um, because they're having to send blood out farther away, they make up most of the heart. They're usually thicker. Um, the right ventricle forms the heart's front surface, anterior surface. And then the left ventricle forms the inferior surface along the back. Um, when contracted, blood is propelled out into the heart into circulation. So the right ventricle, its job is to send blood to the heart for gas exchange. So blood will leave the heart deoxygenated, go to the lungs, drop off the waste gases, pick up the oxygen, and then bring it back to the left side of the heart where the left ventricle will pump it out to the rest of the body. So what ends up happening is we have a very distinct pathway of blood that we see in our bodies, a very distinct circulation path. There is a coloring sheet in your Google Classroom and in the packet that's really important for you to go in and complete. It asks you to color red and blue. It's the only two colors you use. But what that is going to do is going to give you a visual of this pathway of blood because I can talk about it over and over and over again, but seeing it colored that way will really help you. Our heart is basically just pumps. It's a left pump and a right pump. One side or one pump serves the circuit known as the pulmonary circuit. Heart to lungs, heart to lungs, heart to lungs, heart to lungs. The other serves the systemic circuit. This is heart to body, heart to body, heart to body. So very different jobs, but they serve together through this whole mechanism of circulation. So this is a picture of these circuits. Red stands for oxygen-rich blood. This is the blood that has come from the lungs and it's being pumped out to the body. The blue color is deoxygenated blood, meaning that it's used up all its oxygen. It's got a lot of carbon dioxide on it and it needs to go back to the lungs to be reoxygenated and to drop off the waste gases. So if you notice, the right side of the heart deals with deoxygenated blood. The left side of the heart deals with the oxygenated blood. So basically, blood that leaves my body, oxygen poor, carbon dioxide rich, is going to go out. It's going to come in through the right atrium into the right ventricle. The right ventricle will contract and send this blood up through the pulmonary arteries into the lungs. Here, it's going to drop off the CO2, it's going to pick up the O2, and it's going to make its way back. It's going to go back in through the left atrium, down into the left ventricle. The left ventricle will contract, and that blood will squirt back out through the aorta and out to the body with all of its oxygen-rich blood, carbon dioxide, poor blood. And then it just starts over again, it's a constant cycle as long as you have a heartbeat. 
So the pulmonary circuit, the right side, its job is just to move blood that has no oxygen or little oxygen and has high carbon dioxide content over to the lungs. So it goes in through the right side of the heart, right atrium, right ventricle, lungs. So from the body to the right atrium, right ventricle, lungs. Body, right atrium, right ventricle, lungs. And once it gets to the lungs, it drops off its CO2, it picks up its oxygen, and it heads to the left side of the body. On the left side of the body, it goes left atrium, left ventricle, body. Left atrium, left ventricle, body. So it'd be right atrium, right ventricle, lungs left atrium, left ventricle, body, right atrium, right ventricle, lungs, left atrium, left ventricle, body. And this is a constant circuit. Now, here where it happens in the systemic circuit, it's going to pump that blood out and it goes out into the body systems where the oxygen is dropped off, carbon dioxide is picked back up, and it goes right back to the right side. Now, the same amount of blood goes through the right and the left sides, but obviously there's a different workload. The pulmonary circuit, its job is to pump and push blood from the heart to the lungs. Well, how close are the lungs to the heart? They're next door neighbors, so it doesn't have to put a lot of effort into moving the blood from the lungs to the heart. The systemic circuit, though, that's all the areas of the body from the tip of your head to the tips of your toes. So because of that, the left side has to work a lot harder, meaning that it has a much higher pressure, a much longer beat. And so because of that, that side gets five times as much friction. The walls are three times as thick and the cavity is nearly circular because of that. And this is what it looks like. You can see the thickness of this muscle. Remember, the more we work a muscle, the bigger it gets. Same thing with this. The more we work this muscle, the thicker that it's going to get. So there's one more type of circulation that I want to discuss, and that's the coronary circulation. So coronary circulation feeds the heart. So not only do we have to make sure that we get blood to everywhere in the body, we also have to make sure that blood's delivered to the heart. But when the heart is contracting, those muscles are very, very, very tight and blood can't feed its way into that muscle. So the only time that the heart gets blood is when the heart is relaxed. Okay, so when the heart is relaxed, the blood goes in because when it contracts, it compresses those blood vessels and nothing can happen. So this is a picture of some coronary circulation. The red are going to be arteries. The blue are going to be veins. And you can see here that there's major vessels that are running around this heart to feed this atria and ventricle, the muscles that make those up. Now, every now and then, we'll have a weakening of our myocardial cells, which is not good. For some reason, oxygen can't get into the heart. And when it can't get to the heart muscle, it causes that muscle to begin to die. This is usually caused by a blockage. So let me go back to this picture right here. Okay, so let's imagine that there is a blockage right here in this major artery. That means that everywhere around that blockage can't get the oxygen that it needs. And so this tissue begins to die. When that tissue begins to die, we call that a myocardial infarction, or we know it as a heart attack, or sometimes people call it a coronary. So basically it's blockage of an artery the tissue can't get its oxygen, so the tissue dies, and that's what a heart attack or coronary would be. Cardiac muscle is amitotic, which means that we don't make new cardiac muscle whenever it gets damaged. Instead, we make non-contracting non scar tissue, so you lose some of the efficiency and effectiveness of your heart. So we're going to stop there. 
Our next lesson will be on the heart valves, which will be your discussion question. So please review back through this slideshow and make sure that you understand this. And if you have any questions, feel free to email me.